Please welcome to the stage, Eddie Brill! Thank you, brother. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I almost feel like, so I'm taking a shit. I feel like I should start that way. But, but I did earlier, so I don't have a story about it. So um, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I was, uh, <laughs> all right. You know you're gonna get that when you're in Brooklyn. You get that when you're in France. I'm from Brooklyn and people will cheer. And uh, I had a very fantastic childhood. Even though we had no money, I had, a, I had an incredible mom who was a, a big fan of the arts. And with whatever little money we had, we'd go to Broadway shows. I got to see Barbara Streisand do Funny Girl on Broadway. And I got to go to uh, great concerts. So Ike and Tina Turner in Brooklyn perform, which is the best show still to this day that I've ever seen. Because my mom, it was cheaper than a babysitter to actually take me to these events. It was great. And I got to see amazing things. And the thing that we love the most, that we still love to this day, is the movies. I'm a huge movie fan. I, uh, I lied to get a job at the movie theater. I was 14, you needed to be 16. And I just loved it with all my heart. Um, in 1969, 1970, my parents got divorced and we moved to Florida. And uh, my stepfather was amazing and a terrific man. And my mom spent a lot of time with him during that era. So she kind of fell in love with this guy and I had to go on my own to see movies. So I did. Uh, and I went all over Florida to go check out every movie that was out there. And some movies were rated R, and there was one movie, it came out the day before my 15th birthday, and I did a lot of research on it, because that was my mom and I would do, we would do a lot of research on the movies, and really, it was really fun to learn about the great actors and the great directors. And the movie that was coming out the next day that I wanted to see was uh, Mean Streets with Robert De Niro. Right, so some people know it. It's the movie that changed my life and even made me more into films. And the problem was the movie was rated R. I was uh, going to be 15 the next day. Uh, I know you want to do the math. I'm 57. I'll save you, you know, on that. <laughs> I understand. I hear the heads clicking. Um, just saved you a little time and uh, <laughs> the trigonometry homework that you would have had right there. Um, and so the problem being uh, 14 or 15 and the movie's rated R is you can't get in unless you have an adult guardian. And I didn't let that bother me. I was a nuisance. <laughs> I would go to the movie theater parking lot and ask couples if they would bring me in as their kid. <laughs> right. Now, normally it'd be, you'd be an asshole doing that and I probably was, you know, kind of assholey in that way. But I didn't give a shit if they let me in. I got into the movies. I didn't have to hang out with them in the theater. They got me in, and then I sat by myself and enjoyed these films. And when the movie started out, and if you've seen the film, and if you haven't, go tonight after the show to rent it, because it really is, uh, it was impeccable. Uh, Martin Scorsese is the director. It's De Niro's, like, second film, but it's the one that changed his career, Harvey Keitel. And it starts out with one of the greatest lines in film history. Um, you know, if you want to make up for your, you, no one makes up for their sins in church. You do it in the streets, you do it at home, and the rest is bullshit. And I was like, oh yeah, I like that. <laughs> your rhythm of the who was incredibly impeccable. In the streets, the rest is bullshit. Woo! It was, that was rhythmically phenomenal. You couldn't ask for more, so be proud, be, and thanks for being loud. Okay. <laughs> That's how I felt. When I heard that, that was the whole thing of my life. I had gone through religion, uh, I had a mixed religion household, so I knew that it was all bullshit. And I knew it at a young age, which thank God, you know, that I knew. <laughs> um, I learned that. So anyway, so the Nero film was amazing. And the, the next scene, De Niro blows up a mailbox, and then it's the greatest soundtrack in the history of the world, and one of the greatest movies ever. And I became a De Niro freak. And I saw every film of his. I, whatever came out, A Raging Bull or whatever, I just would go and I'd be first in line, and, I would, and as I got older, I didn't need to ask people to let me in with them. And I, but I never met De Niro, and I've been you know, around New York a lot, and everybody I meet in New York has a De Niro story, except me. Everybody, my brother-in-law goes, yeah, I've met De Niro. It's like, how the fuck did you meet De Niro? Oh, you know, at the store, and there he was. He's buying stuff. I was like, fuck, he's my hero. You have a story. And, you know, I worked at the Letterman Show for 17 years. I never met De Niro until toward the end. I didn't really get to meet De Niro, and I wanted to meet him, and I wanted to tell him how much I wanted to be foolish and in front of him and go, yeah, 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 De Niro. <laughs> you know, I wanted to have that experience. So we'll fast forward to 2001. 
Oddly enough, it was October 15th. And I, when I did the research for the story, I was shocked because it was exactly, you know, um, here you have to do the math, 27 plus one is 28 years exactly um, since the movie came out, which was so weird. And it was a, a party that wasn't a fun party, but it was all the biggest stars in New York raising money for 9-11 that just happened just a month earlier. And uh, I came a little bit late to the party. It was the day before my birthday. My girlfriend had taken me to uh, see Urine Town, which I guess fits in the theme of the show so far. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it was all right. It was a decent play. But I got there, and when I walked in the, the party, I saw my two best friends in the world straight away. And they're like, wave. And just as I saw, I looked to the left. There was Robert De Niro. Yeah, there you go. You guys, you guys have worked as an audience before. I don't bullshit me. You guys are good, very good. And and I didn't know what to do. I was panicking. So I remembered another story at that moment, which now I'll take you backwards to 1987. And it was November of 1987, and I had uh, decided to move to Los Angeles, California because Sam Kinison convinced me to move there because that was the place to be if you wanted to be on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. It was the only comedy club in the world that they would really go to uh, and, and find the comics for that. So the first night I uh, moved to LA, I had been there before to work, but Kinison said, move here, you gotta move here. So the first night I go on stage and I follow some comedian, I have a decent set, but after the set, a couple comes up to me and they go, look, we really enjoyed your show. We came to see the guy before you, and he was shit. But you were great. It's like, why the fuck did you have to ruin my excitement by telling me about the other guy? And fuck you. You know, the other guy's a friend of mine, and so he didn't have a great set. I didn't have a killer set. It was just okay. Fuck you. But I, they had a gig, and I'm like, okay. My, that was my inner voice going, fuck you. And, you know, my outer voice says, where's the gig? Um, I was broke. I had no money. Um, and they said it was a $200 gig. And <laughs> ding, 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 you know, and... And uh, fantastic, and it was for the Shriners. You know what the Shriners are? Some of you, yeah, it's, they have, it's like the Elks Club. <laughs> it's fucked up guys who have like hats with a tassel on it. And they dress in suits and you know, whatever the fuck makes them happy, you know. <laughs> I used to work a club in New York called The Fez. You ever work, go to The Fez? Yes. That, yeah, that's where UCB started and that's where, um, yeah, oh, a little information. And it was really fun. <laughs> Got to, that's how I knew Amy Poehler from the old days, and she was always, they were the most brilliant and still continue to be brilliant group in, in the country. But anyway, so I'm gonna do the, the party for the Shriners. So I borrow my friend's car, I don't have a car yet, and I'm driving, and I dressed up nice, thank God. And as I'm driving to the place, because we didn't have GPSs or cell phones or anything at that time, and I'm driving, and I look in the place I'm going to, the building's huge. I misheard them, it wasn't the Shriners. I was working at the Shrine Auditorium. Okay, that was one person, oh, okay. 8,800 seat theater, that where the Academy Awards were. Fuck. I'd only been doing stand-up for like three years. I'd never worked for more than, this is, was probably the biggest size crowd I'd worked to up until that point. And I started shitting my pants, not literally. Uh, again, it would fit if I did in tonight's show. And then, and so I knock at the back door to ask them if I'm in the right place. Hi, my name's Ed. Mr. Brill, follow us, Mr. Brill. I had never been called Mr. Brill. I was like, okay, let's go to this thing. And I walk up these very old stairs, and I'm passing different dressing rooms. And uh, on the left and right are all these famous dress The Shirelles, and the Four Tops, and Jerry Lee Lewis, and Jimmy Stewart. Yes. <laughs> There's no other Jimmy Stewart if you started to go through your heads to figure out, <laughs> is he a rock and roller from the 80s? or No, Jimmy fucking Stewart. Eddie Brill. I'm like, what the fuck? I go in the dress room and I shit myself. That's what happened. No, I was, couldn't believe it. I'm like, what am I doing here? And I look at this, the only, the room is, is very empty, except for one sheet of paper with the order of the show. And it's like Jimmy Stewart, Eddie Brill, the Shirelles. Like, what the fuck, where, what the who, is this a joke? Is it, you know, the guy before me on the stage of the comedy store, he's probably set this whole shit up, you know, it's like. No, but obviously not. So the, the stage manager comes in, he goes, nice to meet you, you're on the show, you have to do seven minutes. I go, what is it, it's a benefit they do every year for children. Um, they came to see the guy before you and he was shit, but they chose you. I'm going, what the fuck is going on with this? Everyone knows that the guy sucked before me and then I'm the one that's chosen. I swear to God, I, 
<laughs> and uh, he goes, and the stage is very big. And I go, well, what is the thing? It's in a, we raise money for children, underprivileged children. We do it every year. And it was originally going to be Joey Bishop. Uh, Joey Bishop was the Rat Pack Sinatra guy. What the fuck am I doing in this place? <laughs> so, uh, so now we go down to the stage. And luckily, the MC of the event I knew. And he was a comic named Vic Dunlop, who unfortunately passed away a year ago. And he was very funny and very sweet man. And he said to me, Eddie, the trick to working a room that big is take your time because the jokes go all the way to the back of the room and give it time to come back. Really be deliberate and you'll do well. So I'm freaking out and look on stage and there's Jimmy Stewart on stage. And, he, and he's up there and he, uh, I know! <laughs> and I got a little bit of a chub, I have to admit. I'm this fucking, it's a wonderful life, Jimmy Stewart. And he's reading poetry because he writes poetry and he's like, well, I've never seen a lovelier tree than a beautiful flower. Fantastic, lovely. And a, you know, it's like getting. And the, the, the stage manager's talking to me, going, Look, when they start announcing you, make your way to the stage because it's so big, you know, whatever. And I, I said, So big, you can see it? And he said, No, no. He, I just made that up now. And, uh, and uh, so. And he goes, ah, oh, a beautiful flower, and thank you very much. And the place goes ballistic, of course. It's Jimmy fucking Stewart in his prime. And he, so he starts walking off the stage, and I'm walking on there announcing, ladies and gentlemen, he's next to me, he's not done anything you've ever heard of. Um, he, we were supposed to get the guy before him, but he sucked, and now the, <laughs> no, they didn't say that. That's what I was thinking in my head. And, uh, and I, they're bringing me up, and I'm working my way. And there's Jimmy Stewart, I don't know what to do. So what do I do? I go. <laughs> and then he goes. <laughs> boom, 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 you know what I mean? <laughs> Fucking Jimmy Stewart went, bah! So I do my show, seven minutes. I fucking crush. Thank you, Vic Dunlop, for the great advice. And I get off stage, and there's Jimmy Stewart. And he's like, oh, very funny, Eddie. He goes, slam, slam, slam. You know, cream uh, corn in my shorts, and it's just fantastic. And, and then Jerry Lewis runs around, and very funny, son. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> so now, here we are back in 2001, and I remembered what I had to do when uh, Robert De Niro started walking my way. So he's walking my, he shook a couple of firemen's hands, he's leaving the party, I could see my friends in the background, and I go. <laughs> and he looks at me, stops for a second, and then grabs me and hugs me, for the best hug I've ever had in my entire life. I am telling you, I have never, I swear on my life, I've never had a better, longer hug before or since then. And I think he thinks I was Danny Aiello. I think he thinks I was Danny Aiello. Because no way does he give a stranger a hug like that. And my friends were looking at me and they're like, like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. What the fuck's going on? And the whole party's looking at me, and every New York star is there. Um, Edie Falco, and James Gandolfini, and Matt Dillon, and uh, Richard Gere, and Carrie Otis. I mean, every star in all of New York is there to help raise money for the firemen. And they're looking like, what the fuck is this guy? And I'm like, I don't even fucking know myself. <laughs> so when the hug was over, and he goes, have a good night. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. So I walked through the party, and I was like, oh, who the fuck is this guy? Who the fuck is this guy? And I walked up to my friends, they go, how do you know De Niro? I go, I don't. <laughs> they go, are you kidding me? You were fucking him on the dance floor in front of everybody. <laughs> so he was fucking me. I just you know, come, gave him a head nod and, and that's all that happened. So all through the night, I'm walking through the party and everyone's like, I get to, you can hear them. They don't, they, they, they're trying to be subtle, but who the fuck is this guy? So now I go to the bar to get everyone a, a beer in my little group of friends. And Clarence Williams III comes up to me. And if you don't know Clarence Williams III, he was Link on the Mod Squad in the 70s TV show. But also he was in all those shitty M. Night Shyamalan movies. But he's a brilliant, brilliant actor and a great, great guy. And he, I didn't meet him until after, but he had come up to me. And I knew he wanted to ask me. I knew he wanted to know how I knew De Niro. But he was one of these guys who didn't want to come off first saying it. It was the longest intro bullshit conversation, small talk ever. So what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a stand-up comedian. Oh, very nice. So where do you work? And blah, blah, blah. I'm going, get to it already. Get to it. So he goes, and by the way, how do you know De Niro? I go, yeah, I know him from Mean Streets. 
I wasn't lying. Anyway, have a lovely night. Thank you very much.